before I get started, now that we have these past two days that have just been so gorgeous, and I'm sure we just can't wait to get out there, um, you know, start doing things in the garden, a word of caution, it's too early. Um, right now, the soil is too wet. It's not good to be working in the garden. You're actually um, harming your soil structure if you're getting out there right now. And also it's too early for our insects and our pollinators. We really should not be cleaning up the garden until our perennials have really um, shown themselves and the weather stays at a consistent 50 degrees during the daytime. So we're really a few weeks away from the optimum time to clean up the garden because we have a lot of insects um, our pollinators, our butterflies, uh, our bees that are spending some portion of their life cycle hidden in leaves or in stems that um, are still standing or in your garden. Okay, so I am going to start and again, um, I created a native plant channel on YouTube where you can find um, videos for free on individual plants. For example, I have one on Baptisia. I have it on, on, on numerous plants. And I also have um, tours of different gardens so you can visit them virtually. And I cover, you know, just a number of topics, even fireflies, because I love them as well. Um, so <laughs> here we go. Our ecosystems are just so out of balance because humans do all kinds of silly things. Meet Dilly the deer, and Dilly the deer um, actually is taken care of by a veterinarian. And uh, the the deer, uh, she, you know, she found this deer, and, <laughs> and uh, the deer was blind and injured, so she gave Dilly her own bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, Dilly has all kinds of social media accounts and people follow her. But, you know, just an example of the kinds of things that silly things that people do. And particularly because the four legged large mammals are, you know, everybody finds them cute and cuddly and they do all kinds of things for them. But um, imagine cleaning up after this one. You think your children are bad to clean up after. Um, all right, and as far as um, our ecosystems, you may have heard about the insect apocalypse and the idea that we are losing insects at a very fast rate over the last few, um, you know, over the last few years or the last um, decade or two. Um, and there is a lot of concern that many insects are facing extinction at the rate that they are going. And the reason that this becomes a problem is because of pollination. Um, and this isn't a problem that's 20, 30, 40 years away. Um, this is already occurring. There are places in China where they are um, hand pollinating fruit trees because they don't have enough insects to pollinate them. So it's not a problem that's, oh, you know, it's just, it's far into the future. No, it's already occurring, okay? Um, in 2019, there was a documentary done called The Pollinators, um, showing how 1.8 million honeybee hives in the California Central Valley have to be moved around uh, when it comes time for the almond trees to be pollinated because there's not enough bees. Um, now, um, I'm not sure of the knowledge level of um, all, of the, all of you who might be listening tonight uh, because some of you may be saying, oh yeah, but honeybees, they're not native anyway. And um, you know, so we shouldn't be as concerned about honeybees. We should be concerned about our native bees which is true as well. You know, we have concerns about our native bees and, you know, we want to do everything to protect them. But just, you know, to emphasize the problem that there is a problem with having sufficient numbers of pollinators, okay? And let's take a look at what the grocery store would look like without bees. Um, on the left, you see your produce choices today, your general amount of, you know, your typical produce store. 
Um, and I forget, I believe this may have been um, Whole Foods that put this together. This is not me. I believe this was Whole Foods. And on the right, you see what your produce section would look like without bees. So I hope you like a lot of oranges because <laughs> that might leave you with oranges and some other things, but a lot of our produce in the grocery stores would be gone. And uh, you chocoholics out there um, like me, uh, chocolate is pollinated by this tiny insect called a midge. And um, you know, without that, there would be no chocolate. Okay, but gardeners have a lot of power. Our ecosystems are out of balance. Um, there's habitat loss. There are invasive plants. There are invasive insects. You know, for if you're uh, if you're aware, you're probably seeing a lot in the news about looking out for the spotted lanternfly, for example, which is our latest pest. Um, and of course, uh, the huge problem with climate change. But think of yourself as an ecosystem manager. As an ecosystem manager, you control what lives and dies in your garden. So you can help our native forms, such as our native bees, our native plants, by becoming informed and by um, you know, planting them in your garden where you can create an entire ecosystems. We can't change huge areas, but our gardens can provide habitats and influence others to provide a refuge for insects and birds as well. Um, and as you learn how to do things, you can teach others as well. And then your neighbors can follow in your footsteps. Okay. So why use natives? Well, we need, need to go back to some uh, high school biology <laughs> and uh, food webs. Um, larger organisms eat smaller ones and plants are the only organisms that can capture the sun's energy and turn it into food. So the food that plants create help feed larger and larger organisms eventually up until it gets you know, it gets to us. And our current land use is not sustainable, particularly because we have so many, um, so much land area devoted to lawns and lawns do not feed our insects and pollinators. They do not provide food for them. And in fact, what they do is harm our ecosystems due to the number of, um, the amount of fertilizer that's used on them the amount of pesticides that are used to control insects in the lawn that people are trying to kill. Um, so you, I you know, urge you to consider reducing the size of your lawn and turning your, more of your lawn areas into um, guard, native plant gardens. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the most important pollen plants to support bees. In the mid-Atlantic states, there are 69 species of native bees that would be absent without the pollen of willows, blueberries, goldenrods, asters, and evening primrose. So these five plants support 69 different native bee species. And that's according to Doug Tallamy, um, who if you, um, are aware of who he is. He is an entomologist and uh, he is a leader in promoting native plants and gardeners uh, using native plants. Um, unfortunately with these plants, the problem with all of them is, is that deer eat them. So we are going to be talking about um, some other plants as well. Okay. So again, other, um, you know, reasons to use natives. Again, they are the only uh, organism that can turn energy from the sun into food. Um, and our native plants have co-evolved with the insects and it's what these insects eat. They can't eat the plants that come from Europe and Asia, et cetera. Um, something that people aren't familiar with, many people aren't familiar with, is that the majority of insects are species specific, meaning they need one species of plant 
um, for their survival. And most gardeners are familiar with the relationship between the monarch and the milkweed, that without milkweeds, there would be no monarchs. But other insects function the same way because they are also specific to specific plants. So although um, butterflies and other insects will go from flower to flower for nectar or pollen, um, there is usually a specific family or species of plants that they need in order to complete their entire life cycle. Okay. And as far as um, using natives, a quarter of all species are threatened with extinction due to human activity. Um, and here you have some of the examples of the different um, life forms that are threatened with extinction right now. You're seeing 40% of amphibians are threatened. 34% um, of our conifers, even when we go to um, our oceans, 33% of our reef corals, 33% of marine mammals, our sharks and rays, um, crustaceans, 25% of our mammals, and um, according to this statistic, 14% of our birds. Okay. And here I mentioned a Doug Tallamy, um, whose resource Nature's Best Hope is an excellent book. So um, according to his book, in addition to the many species that are already extinct, 8,500 plants and animals, more than one third of cur current species are in danger of extinction in North America. So um, there's a lot to be concerned with in terms of possible extinctions. And how do native plants help animals survive? Well, um, Talamy did a study and 96% and of birds rear their young on insects. And you wouldn't, you can't imagine just how many, how, you know, what a large volume of insects they eat. Um, in his study, a little chickadee needs 350 to 570 caterpillars per day to feed its babies. Um, some birds, including some woodpeckers, make over 4,000 trips a day to feed their young. So can you imagine that? All the, uh, the amount of energy that that requires in order to fly 4,000 trips. Um, this is also why they need to have plants near um, their, you know, near where they live because, you know, there's only so many miles that they can spend flying back and forth looking for food. Um, and caterpillars are extremely important. Um, you know, when we talk about insects, it is caterpillars that really do the bulk of feeding birds, okay? And unfortunately, we are close, according to the late John Black, president of the Native Plant Society of New Jersey, or former president of the Native Plant Society of New Jersey, uh, we are currently losing, he is saying, as much as 70% uh, of our insects. So for, especially for the bird lovers out there, think of your native plants as bird feeders, right? That you don't have to refill, okay? Another important um, feature of native plants is that they help control um, stormwater, stormwater management. They are good at absorbing these huge amounts of rain. And a huge, um, a great example of how this comes into play was uh, 2019, where New Jersey had to close many lakes. Our largest, Lake Hapatcong, was closed, as well as I believe, if I remember correctly, I believe it was six different lakes in New Jersey that closed that summer um, due to the algal blooms and the bacteria. And um, the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protect Protection listed lawn fertilizers and you know garden fertilizers as one of the causes that leads to these algal blooms and these uh pro these problems with our lakes 
So native plants, number one, they don't use fertilizers. You don't need to fertilize them. You don't need to spend money on fertilizing them, time on fertilizing them. And um, you contribute to our ecosystems by not allowing this fertilizer then to run off to other places into our water systems. Okay. So let's talk about what exactly is a native plant. And in general, it is a plant growing in a specific location before European exploration. And um, in terms of, you know, it, people interpret that broadly. Like for example, when we talk about a native plant, are we talking about a plant that grows anywhere in New Jersey? Or are we talking a plant, about a plant that grows in only the specific area of New Jersey where you live? So there are different interpretations for that as well. And some people get more specific than others. Okay. Um, so exactly, you know, or are we talking about the Northeast? Um, in general, you know, the plants that I am going to go over are plants that in the Northeast, they may not necessarily have been native specifically to New Jersey. So my interpretation is a little bit more broad um, because um, we're dealing with deer. And you know, if you look at only the plants that grew in New Jersey that deer don't eat, then you're, you know, severely limiting your plant choices. And another controversy in the native plant community is should gardeners plant or use cultivars or what are referred to also as nativars or cultivar, cultivars of native plants. Um, and a cultivar is basically a clone. Um, a plant has been bred or is being used because it has a specific characteristic um, that is found uh, desirable. Um, it's, you know, some native plant enthusiasts um, are completely against using cultivars where some are saying, well, it kind of depends on the cultivar. Um, in general, you wanna aim for diversity. And the best way to aim for diversity is to use plants that you can reproduce from seed that are not clones. Um, but let's take a look you know, at some examples. Um, changing the color of a flower appears to have a negative effect in terms of um, its usefulness to pollinators. For example, changing the color of purple coneflower, which is usually pink, if you're familiar with it, it's a pinkish color. If when you change it to the um, orange or the red or the yellow varieties, they seem to be less attractive to pollinators, okay? Um, usually if the benefit that the cultivar provides is to make the plant more compact. Um, it appears to have the same value to pollinators. So it kind of depends on what the cultivar um, is being bred to do. If it changes the flower, again, it could have a very negative effect on pollinators. If you're leaving the flower pretty much the same and you're just producing a more compact, shorter growing plant, um, it appears to have the same values to pollinators. Okay. And um, you can always tell cultivar because its name will, you know, it'll have a name like, uh, you know, uh, purple coneflower echinacea magnus, um, and it'll be in like quotes. Okay. One thing that you want to consider is native ours with red leaves. You should not use them. If your goal is to attract uh, insects and pollinators, cultivars would, with red leaves are not a good choice. Um, research has found that the insects that need leaves um, to survive, to eat, which is most of them, you know, for example, caterpillars, caterpillars munch on leaves. Um, research has shown that red leaves are not as attractive to them. Um, they have a harder time eating them. 
So you would want to avoid the cultivars or the native bars that have red leaves. And a popular one that is a native plant is nine bark, which is shown in this photo. And it's a lovely shrub, um, produces lovely flowers, does attract pollinators, but the ones with red leaves are not as useful. You, you, know, you want your insects to eat the leaves. That's what you're doing is creating good habitat, good ecosystems. So um, having leaves that are eaten is a good thing. And uh, research has found that it's usually that, you know, in general, because you know, some people think like, oh my God, but if they eat all the leaves and my plants are gonna look terrible, um, usually you're not gonna even notice the, the damage. Um, some studies have found that um, leaves have to be eaten, but that approximately 10% of a plant's leaves have to be damaged for a gardener to even notice that the plant is being eaten. Okay, so we want to grow natives, but we've got those deer running in our yards, right? And this is example of what my garden looks like in the spring after a winter and after the deer have been tracking through it. And you know, particularly here on the uh, left, you can see all the deer droppings that have been left behind. Uh, the only thing missing from this photo is that um, my husband, uh, one particular one, this really, this particular year when things were really bad, he decided to go out there with a shop vac to clean it all up. So that's what's missing from the photo is my husband with a shop vac cleaning it up. Um, so the problem is that deer have also co-evolved with our native plants and eat most of them. Um, New Jersey has about 2,700 native plants and the deer are going to find almost all of them attractive. And we have an overabundant deer population. Biologists state that the sustainable levels of deer should be five to 15 individuals per square mile. New Jersey averages 112 per square mile with some areas as high as 270. And uh, I wonder, well, how do you even figure this out, right? Do you send people out and start counting, you know, individually how many are out there? And uh, how it's done is um, drones are sent out with, I guess, some type of infrared camera to take photographs of areas. So the deer show up in, on these infrared uh, photographs and um, you're able to count them and see how many there are in particular areas. And that's how they figure it out. Okay. And the overabundant deer population, besides eating these native plants um, that we enjoy, what happens is they destroy the understory in our woods. Um, the lower growing plants, the, uh, the shrubs, the tree saplings, the trees that are trying to grow. So once our native plants are gone, they now can't compete with the invasive plants from other countries um, that we have planted that have escaped into our woods and that provide no food for our wildlife. Here, all the way on the right, you have a Japanese uh, stilt grass, which is believed to have entered the country as just a packing material in boxes. And um, the stilt grass, just, you know, if you're familiar with this, you know, grows very rapidly and takes over an area where all you'll see is stilt grass. Um, in the center photograph, you have another plant from Japan, Japanese barberry. And um, this one is particularly tough because um, it has all those thorns. It's really quite a chore to get rid of it. And um, it is so widely sold in garden centers, particularly when a gardener comes in and says, you know, can you give me a shrub that the deer won't eat? They're gonna recommend Japanese barberry. And it produces little berries that the birds eat and then they spread all over in our woods. And then um, the barberry turns into these thickets of thorns in our woods that you can't walk through as you see in the photo in the center. And which then you know, will outcompete the native shrubs that 
should be there instead. Um, then these invasive plants destroy the lives of insects and birds that would rely on the native plants. Science Magazine reports a loss of 3 billion birds or 29% of North American birds um, since 1970. Um, so we lose our insects, we lose our birds. Again, we have to remember that there is a food web and um, everything has its place in it, including the deer. But right now we just have too many of them. And then before I get to the plants that you can use, um, I just wanna mention some widely sold invasive plants that you should not plant. Um, they will escape into local woods and you'll see these growing in places. And we have uh, some here, Japanese barberry, which I've mentioned before, uh, winged burning bush or um, euonymus, which is you know, a, a shrub with this bright red fall color that's planted for that fall color, escapes into our woods and shades out our native plants. You have um, Chinese and Japanese, or there's a typo there, Chinese and Japanese wisteria. Um, you can find that like even growing along the highway on uh, Route 3. Um, English ivy, which you see all over the place, um, that's a problem. And the very uh, popular calorie pear. So everybody looks at, you know, the, the pears in springtime and oh, how pretty, but those have escaped into woods, especially in central Jersey and are causing a problem in central Jersey. And a plant that many of you are probably going to be very disappointed to see on this list is butterfly bush. Um, because butterfly bush, especially um, in areas um, near roadsides and drier areas, it has been found to be escaping into those areas and becoming a problem, an invasive problem. So that's one that's uh, more of uh, an up and coming one, which um, native plant societies and conservation groups recommend that gardeners do not use, do not plant. Okay. And I want to, uh, full disclosure here, um, if you notice the photograph of my garden, I do have a butterfly bush in there. And, uh, you know, based on everything that I've been learning about and I'm planning to pull mine out this spring and, uh, and replace that. Okay. Okay. So let's look at some plants that are often listed as deer resistant, but aren't. Um, because if you've been looking at lists, there are a lot of lists out there um, with plants that are deer resistant. And it is a hard um, thing to, you know, to pin down because um, deer will eat things in one area that they won't eat in another area. And, um, it also depends on how much other food is available to them because they kind of had a, a you know, their A list and then their B list and then their C list. And so what happens is if they can't find the items on their A list, well, they'll start eating some items from their B list. And if they can't find food items on their A and B list, well, then they'll start moving on to their C list and we'll get to things that maybe, you know, your friend in another town you know, has told you, oh, they never touch it here, but they're eating it in your garden. Um, but some things that are often given on these as being deer resistant are viburnums. They are not. Purple coneflower is not. Um, Carolina allspice or, or sweet shrub is also not deer resistant. It was in my garden for a long time, and then they uh, started getting to that as well. Now, really the most effective way to deer proof a garden is a fence. And um, if you are able to fence in some area of your garden, it's going to save you a lot of heartache in the long run. Um, a lot of, um, you know, a lot of other time trying to come up with other measures to keep them out. So if you are able to 
um, put in a fence, that's going to be your best protection um, and over the long run is going to make you happier. Um, this one was just a cute example that I found on the internet. This one would not keep the deer out because it's too low, but uh, it was very clever and uh, I admire the, uh, the handiwork done on this one. Okay. All right, so let's talk about some design because um, native plants can be used in formal designs. They're not only for meadows or for, you know, some people think, well, they're, you know, they're meadows, they, they look messy, they're always flopping over. Um, but consider that it's all about the design. It's not about the plant. Native plants can look neat and straight and, you know, as any formal garden would. Um, this is an excellent resource for native plant gardeners. Um, Mount Cuba Center in Delaware. So you can visit it, you can take about, you know, two hour ride in the spring is one of its, you know, one of the times when it's at its most beautiful. Um, but if you like to go visit gardens and you're interested in native plants, this is definitely one to go visit. You'll get all kinds of ideas on native plants here. Um, it was a former um, estate that then um, was given over and opened up to the public and promotes the use of native plants. So um, let's take a look at the plants, some of the plants. Um, you have your list. I have broken up the list for you. Um, according to sun exposure and according to whether a plant is a perennial or a shrub, et cetera. So um, I believe pretty much, except for maybe two, I'm not sure that I have on the list. I think that all the plants on this presentation are on the list. But let's uh, begin with Hubrix Blue Star. This is the 2011 perennial plant of the year from the Perennial Plant Association. Um, it has these leaves that look like needles. This is a perennial. It grows about uh, three, three and a half foot tall and, um, you know, stays in place, is, uh, makes a mound shape, has a mound shape to it. And um, really, when you're using it in the garden, it almost takes on the look of a shrub. Like if you look at it, it you know, it resembles a shrub in some ways. In the spring, it has these silvery blue flowers that do feed pollinators. Um, on this particular blue star, the flowers, you know, it doesn't put on this huge flower show. They're more um, spread out over the plant. Um, but they are attractive, they do attract pollinators, and the plant does look good even when it's not in bloom. And then in the fall, it looks especially nice because it picks up this yellow fall color. So you have nice texture, this needle, uh, needle leaf texture um, throughout the gardening season. You have flowers in the spring and beautiful yellow color in the fall. Okay, the, um, the pink here is a peony and which is not native. So for those of you that have peonies, they're beautiful plants and peonies are, you know, they're um, not a problem in terms of being invasive. So, you know, if you have them, you don't, it's not a plant you need to rip out, but the plant growing with it is an Amsonia as well. The first one was an Amsonia. This one is a cultivar. Um, you'll notice it by the way that the, the name blue ice is shown. So this one is a cultivar. So, um, it is low growing till about 18 inches tall. Um, of the Amsonias, you're going to see the flowers on this one have the prettiest blue color and it does feed a lot of insects in the spring. The Amsonias that you're going to be seeing, I'm going to show you three of them. 
Um, they are easy to grow as are most native plants. You know, they're not, you know, very few of them are fussy. Um, they, you know, they are adaptable to different kinds of soil. Um, Hubrix blue star will grow, the, the one you saw earlier, this one grows, will grow in average, soils of average moisture to dry uh, soils, you know, it will tolerate drought, um, as will this one, um, but it has, this one is more of a ground cover, low growing, eight, up, up to 18 inches at most, and beautiful blue flowers, okay? This one is Eastern Blue Star, the third of the Amsonias we are looking at. This one is a little bit taller growing, growing about uh, three and a half, maybe even, you know, a nice specimen will grow close to four foot tall. Um, blue flowers in the spring as well. This one does put on a nice flower show. The, the flower is not as deep blue as the one I showed you uh, before, but still a pretty blue, very pretty blue color. Um, attracts pollinators such as this clear wing moth. Um, so, you know, another lovely plant. Now, all of these, the Amsonias have a white milky sap. Um, so they all do have a white milky sap. And, um, you know, that's probably what helps, <laughs> helps it be poisonous to deer or, you know, unattractive to deer. Um, please note that the deer will browse everything. So um, in my garden in the spring, they will eat some of these. Um, you know, they'll take some nibbles here, but you're not gonna lose the entire plant because after browsing it, after tasting it, they won't eat the whole thing because they'll discover that it's not for them. Um, another thing about the Amsonias with the milky sap regarding the, the milky sap, when you are cutting it back, um, you don't want to get it on your skin because it does produce an allergic reaction in some people. Um, so you want to be careful with that. Okay. And here we have another plant with the uh, milky sap, and that is swamp mil milkweed. This one grows in average soil. It grows in wet soils. So if you have a wet area, um, you can use this. And of course, this is one of the top plants for uh, attracting monarch butterflies. The monarch butterflies, their caterpillars eat the leaves of this plant as well as other milkweeds. Um, it just has a lovely pink color. Um, so don't let that name milkweed scare you. You know, unfortunately, um, a lot of our native plants have that term weed in their name, milkweed, butterfly weed, um, iron weed. And, uh, you know, will automatically, uh, you know, turns off some people thinking that, you know, they're items that you should not use in your garden. Um, so, you know, I'll, a lot of our native plants, unfortunately, have that weed name in them. Um, but swamp milkweed then will allow you to have the entire monarch butterfly life cycle occur in front of you from the caterpillar stage, which you are seeing here in the center photo, um, to the chrysalis. And I just wanted to show you the chrysalis is quite beautiful. Um, all the way on the left, you're seeing, you're beginning to notice, you can actually, uh, this is really at the end, if, if you ever have seen the photographs or have seen the uh, monarch chrysalis, you know that it has more of a jade color to it. And then it has a lot of the gold um, speckling along the edges. Uh, this photograph I included because this shows you one where the butterfly is going to be emerging soon. So the um, chrysalis starts becoming clearer and you can see the butterfly through it. The black one that butterfly is really uh, just about to emerge when you see it. Because most, you know, if you're not familiar with the life cycle, you'll usually see photographs that show you this bright jade chrysalis, and which it is during most of its stage. 
Um, but then just as the butterfly is getting ready to emerge, you're, it's going to turn either more of the clear see-through or uh, the black. And then another milkweed is the orange milkweed, just a beautiful, bright orange color. This one is lower growing than the swamp milkweed, which can grow about three feet tall. This one is usually more like um, 18 inches to two feet tall. Um, sends out, has a very deep tap root. So it doesn't like to be moved. Once you have it in one place and it's doing well for you, um, leave it alone because it doesn't like to be moved. Now, um, the milkweeds are one of those plants that have been deer resistant for a very long time, but now because of our uh, growing deer population, they are sometimes um, eaten by the deer as well. Okay. And this is blunt mountain mint. If you want pollinators in your garden, um, which most of you probably do, and that's why you're here. Um, you wanna make sure you have mountain mint. This plant is incredible. Um, they absolutely love it. Um, the flowers on it are really nothing, you know, nothing to write home about as they say. Um, in the photograph on the right, you'll see just a, the small ring of flowers in the center. They tend to be whitish or pinkish or, you know, a, you know, mostly white, but they have a little pink to them or a little lavender to them. But you'll see them have these silvery bracts on the outside. So the leaves of the plant are green, but at the top surrounding the true flower, you have these silvery bracts that kind of have a dusted look, almost like a, a the look of a, of snow dusting on top. And it makes the plant very attractive. It's the bracts, the silvery bracts that keep the plant looking more attractive. Um, this one is a very strong stemmed plant. So it'll stay very upright for you. It grows about three foot tall. Um, it does spread, but don't let that name mint. It is a mint. Um, but don't let that you know scare you off if you've grown mint it's not as aggressive as the you know the mints that we use in our gardens for you know uh, for flavoring food and, and spices and things like that um it's it is not as aggressive as those mints um and it's just i just want to see if let's see if this works you can just see the insects buzzing all over and all kinds um, from bees to these other insects that have metallic uh, colors to them. Um, you know, just to give you a flavor for the wide variety and some of the smaller butterflies are attracted to it as well. Next slide. And um, in the winter, you get these dried flower heads that, you know, for those of you who are creative, um, you can just grab some of these uh, flower heads, maybe throw a little silver paint on them or something and uh, use them in an arrangement. And pearly everlasting. Um, here's a plant that's rather not that easy to find. <laughs> Um, you do need to go to one native plant source for them, and it's really not that easy to find at all. Um, these small white flowers, the people the, that are interested in this are basically the people who love butterflies, the people who love native plants, and people who like to work with dried flowers. These are used uh, in dried flower arrangements as well. Um, it starts blooming in July and really goes through until September. So um, it does a, has a long time of bloom. You can see it here in the photo on the left. So it kind of mounds, it will spill over. It grows about two foot tall. Um, you know, it'll take it a little bit of time to get to that, but then, you know, it will grow about two foot tall, 
spreads nicely for you, but not at all aggressive. And one of the uh, most fantastic things about it is that it is the caterpillar food plant for the American lady butterfly. Um, so you want to be careful when you're looking at the plant and the tip of the plant has um, what looks like a little spider web to it. Um, that's a good thing, you want that. That means you are now hosting caterpillars for of the American lady butterfly, which depending on um, the caterpillars instar and an instar is the um, stage the caterpillar is in. Caterpillars have four or five instars, which means that um, when they're younger, they're gonna look one way, such as the caterpillar and on the bottom left photo looks almost all black. And then the caterpillar on the top left photo is now a more full grown one. Um, this is, you know, the one of the final stages. I believe that is the final stage before it actually um, becomes, goes into its chrysalis. Um, so, and by having this, it's very reliable, it means you have this butterfly. This is what the American lady butterfly looks like. So let them eat the leaves, um, you know, let them look a little bit raggedy because what you're doing is helping this beautiful butterfly. Okay. And um, you might be familiar with this plant, Pussy Toes, which is also a host plant for the American Lady Caterpillar. Uh, this one is um, a lot lower growing than the Pearly Everlasting. It prefers rocky, gritty, poor soils, and it takes much longer to spread than the Pearly Everlasting. Um, but if you have rocky, gritty, poor soils, um, you might want to try Pussy Toes again, which is also deer resistant. And you can, uh, um, one characteristic of deer resistant plants that these plants are showing that the uh, American Lady, excuse me, that the uh, Pearly Everlasting and the Pussy Toes are shown, showing is the fuzzy gray leaves. So fuzzy gray leaves are um, an indicator that it'll be a plant that deer will not want to eat. And here we go, just another wonderful plant, hyssop or anise hyssop, um, also called by its uh, scientific name is Agastaki. And um, this one has these lovely lavender spiked flowers. Um, it has that licorice scent when the leaves are crushed. Um, it blooms for a long time, will start blooming in July. It'll go for a, for a long time reseeds very easily. So, you know, you can grab seeds, spread them to new places. On the, in the photo on the right, you have the, um, it's, also, uh, uh, it's also called licorice mint. So anise hyssop, licorice mint, hyssop. On the in the photo on the right, it's in the foreground with the white plant in the background is pearly everlasting. And it just smells wonderful. You can use this for cooking as well. Um, I use, um, you know, I've, there are all types of recipes on the internet using this in food for everything from chicken to cookies. Um, I use it, the easiest way to use it is grab a few sprigs and put them in your lemonade and it gives you an, a nice fresh flavor, okay? And I love this plant. Another reason I love this plant is this is the plant that the goldfinches in my garden absolutely love. Um, so, you know, every summer I get to see the goldfinches come and eat the seeds. So once it goes to seed, they're out there um, eating the seeds. You can see the bees buzzing around as well. So just an excellent pollinator plant for bees, and then when it goes to seed, you'll see the goldfinches. All right, and our next plant, blue wild indigo, also called false indigo, and uh, that's Baptisia. It is the 2010 perennial plant 
Association Perennial of the Year. In general, it's blue. Um, so um, it's called wild indigo because when you go back to colonial times, um, the dye that was used for blue to turn, you know, to turn clothing blue, to turn fabric blue was in general indigo. Um, but then there came a time when it became scarce and this plant was used to color uh, as a, it was used as a blue dye. Unfortunately, it was not as effective as indigo was in turning fabrics blue, but uh, so it was called false indigo. That's where that name comes from. Um, lovely plant. Now, a cultivars, you know, for those who are interested in them, the straight species is going to be blue. So this one is basically a straight species grown from seed. Um, it's a slow growing plant, so it will take a while for it to look this dense as this one does on the left. Um, very long uh, lasting plant. I think my plant that you see here is uh, 15 or more years old. So it will last a long time. Now, again, the when because this is a slow growing plant, you do have to protect it from the deer while it is young um, so that they won't get to it. And then once it's established, they'll come and take a few bites, but they will not eat the entire plant. And these are some of the cultivars that um, Mount Cuba has found superior, uh, Cherry's Jubilee, Lemon Meringue, and uh, Blueberry Sunday. Okay. And it is the host plant for the wild indigo dusky wing, uh, which is a skipper, one of the um, butterfly relatives. So again, you are providing a plant that's attractive in your garden that gives your, you know, that is long blooming. It'll bloom for about three weeks and will also feed the caterpillars of, um, the, of this skipper. And again, especially when plants are young, you want to protect them with some type of barrier because, you know, they're small and the deer browsing them will um, basically just destroy the plant. So you want to give them an opportunity to get large enough to survive the browsing. So um, I use, you know, just use whatever you can find, um, you know, some, either this plastic netting, which is not as expensive or, you know, metal, metal cages. If you can make metal cages, that's even better. Now let's talk about some perennials for shade. And uh, most ferns are fairly deer resistant. So for those of you that have shade, not, uh, not all of them, and again, they will browse them, um, but ostrich fern on the left and marginal shield fern, uh, which grows uh, a little bit shorter, but ostrich fern can get um, taller. Uh, two feet tall or so um, are two options for you. And again, just ferns are lovely. They're, you know, they'll, depending on the fern, they can spread nicely in your um, garden. Um, and some others, the lady fern. Um, it's just lovely, very graceful. You have just beautiful texture with the dissected leaves. On the right, um, you have one lady fern uh, with red stems. So you get, you're adding the red color and this one is lady in red. And again, you know, regarding the cultivars and using cultivars, you want to try, the, the best thing in your garden is to have a very diverse planting. So, you know, if you wanna put ferns out there, don't just rely, oh, say, okay, all right, so this particular fern, lady in red, it looks beautiful. I want, you know, 20 of them. Um, that's not a good thing in terms of establishing a, a good ecosystem. Um, you want diversity. You want to have, you know, different plants and you want plants also that can uh, reproduce 
um, on their own. Okay. And over here, we have a bleeding heart. Uh, on the left is, um, this one is fairly deer resistant, blooms for a long time. Again, this one is, this particular one is a cultivar. This one is luxuriant. It does bloom for a very long time. You want to avoid uh, Dicentra spectabilis, which is the one on the right. This is the more famil familiar bleeding heart. It grows very large. It has these attractive flowers, but this is not native. The one on the right is not native. Um, so you want to be sure you're getting the native variety. And grasses. Grasses in general are deer resistant. Who would think that, right? You figure, okay, the deer should be eating grasses, um, but they actually don't. Our native grasses are uh, relatively safe or pretty safe from deer. Um, my favorite is actually little blue stem. And uh, it has a bluish tint to the leaves. And then um, when it flowers, you know, uh, grasses are considered to flower as well, as you see here on the right, that is also a little blue stem. It sends up these plumes, these um, buff colored blooms. Um, and little blue stem is important for many um, types of uh, caterpillars. It feeds the caterpillars of numerous uh, skippers. And it looks attractive in the garden. It goes with so many different plants, adds texture. And um, even in the winter, if you, you know, because if you have a native plant garden, um, you don't want to cut grasses down for the winter. You're not going to start cutting them down again until um, into the spring, once the temperatures are staying um, consistently in the 50s. Uh, once the perennials have really started coming up, you know, they're there for you to see. That's when you can start cleaning up your garden. Okay. And you also have a switchgrass, panicum, which is taller growing. These can grow four or five foot tall. Um, again, they add a lot of texture to the garden. When they are in bloom, they have these, you know, billowy clouds that are also lovely. And they also feed a number of skippers, such as this Delaware skipper. And again, for those of you not familiar, skippers are relatives of the butterflies. Um, they're, they are the, in the uh, uh, order of, the, they are Lepidoptera. So butterflies, skippers, and moths all are Lepidoptera. And here are some examples of switchgrass, um, heavy metal on the left, and Shenandoah on the right, which has uh, some reddish leaves to it. And a wonderful thing about the grasses is that with the right lighting, they just seem to glow. Like, um, you know, when the sun hits them from behind at the, at the right angle, you'll see them like this, and th this is a switchgrass, and they just appear to, to glow. They're just absolutely fabulous in, in the lighting in the fall, okay? And another easy to grow plant is uh, wood oats, which has these um, seed capsules. They start forming probably about July or so, and will last, you know, well into the fall. Um, they start out as green. To me, they remind me of like little fish hanging on a fishing rod. Um, just, you know, just very lovely. And uh, they're also very attractive to birds. The birds eat the seeds in the fall. And evergreens. This is going to be a very short list because the deer eats so many of them. Um, but here we have inkberry which is an ilex, a holly, uh, same genus as um, hollies. Um, it, and it is basically, you know, it has these small shiny green leaves, um, can be cut back, kept pruned, and can be really substituted for boxwood, which is not native and these days is suffering from a number of um, diseases. 
So it also tolerates very wet spots. So if you have a wet spot in your garden and are looking for um, an evergreen plant for it, inkberry is a good one for you. And you have a dog hobble or lacothoe is another, um, another shrub that you can use in your garden. In the spring, it has these bell-shaped flowers and uh, it is um, pretty deer resistant. And again, there are different lacothoes. Some of them are not native. So you want to make sure that you get, you know, I, I'm not gonna, you know, bore you with the Latin names, but you do have it on your list so that you know if you're getting a native one or not. Okay. And the last one here is called uh, lamb kill or sheep laurel. And uh, basically it's called lamb kill because it's known to kill mammals that eat it. Um, again, it, it's, you know, deer will browse anything. Um, this one grows one to three feet tall, so it'll stay low growing for you. Okay. And shrubs. Um, again, a very short list as far as what's deer resistant. This one is bottle brush buckeye, which grows tall, has these uh, lovely candelabra type flowers. Um, the leaves are rather large. So this is a shrub that's really for a large area. It is tall growing. It does um, spread, you know, although it's going to take time for it to spread. And it does well in shade and part shade locations as well. And um, American Beautyberry. Um, during most of the season, it has, you know, these rather small leaves. Um, you know, when you look at the shrub, most of the season, it just looks like a regular green shrub, nothing to write home about. Um, has small pinkish flowers, but then in the fall, that's when you really get, you know, when it, when it really earns its name, uh, Beautyberry, with these purplish flowers. Um, they persist for a good long time, just extremely attractive and uh, also will feed birds. So I just want to, you want to encourage you to observe and enjoy nature in your backyard. Um, you'll never know what you're gonna find. You know, one, one day I came out and uh, found this spider had created this web <laughs> and uh, was busy having its meal and it's just pretty fascinating to, you know, once you go out there, go out there and look, see what you find, look for movement in your garden. There's so many things to see. So um, I did want to throw in two plants in here that are just wonderful as far as being um, plants for pollinators. Um, but these are, these two, I want to make it clear, these are not deer resistant. You have to protect them until they get tall enough. And this one is summer sweet, also called sweet pepper bush. Um, the flowers are extremely fragrant. Flowers in July draws a ton of pollinators and butterflies. You could be able to see the movement on here. You can see that um, if you notice the bottom <laughs> before it went to zooming in, if you notice the bottom, you'll see that there, um, all the leaves were gone. That's because the deer eat the bottom but you have to protect it until it gets tall enough because it does grow about eight foot tall. And uh, coral honeysuckle or uh, Alonisera with these red flowers, it just covers itself with these red flowers in um, May, it looks like this, but the flowers will continue really into September or even longer um, just not as heavily. They'll just, uh, you know, they, they won't appear as dense as this one. And again, if you look at the bottom, the bottom is gone because the deer have eaten it. Uh, but, you know, if you've protected it and allowed it to get tall enough, it will, um, you know, it will be able to overcome that. Okay, and this is what the flowers look like. And this is the top plant in my garden for hum hummingbirds. They love this plant. And because it has such a long season of bloom, 
um, it provides food for them for really the whole summer. Okay. Um, trees that are very important. These uh, I'm putting on these on here just for those of you who are interested in butterflies or Lepidoptera, um, because uh, Doug Tallamy has found oaks to be so valuable to for you know 534 different caterpillars use oaks um, as their food source. So that's very valuable for our birds as well. Okay. And so we want to bring balance to our landscapes and we can do that one garden at a time. So rather than these huge expanses of lawn that don't feed our pollinators, you can be an ecosystem manager and create a section of your garden that brings life to your garden. And again, consider supporting efforts to manage deer populations. I've given you uh, this information earlier, so I won't repeat it, but consider supporting efforts that do that. They are very cute. This one was born in my garden this past spring. Um, you know, they are, you know, they are beautiful animals. Um, there's just too many of them. There need to be, they, you know, when we you know, when we just go to saving the deer, that means that you are decreasing um, the food supply for birds and so many other animals, um, you know, that, that's causing a problem. All right, and for people who feed the deer, I know that, you know, many gardeners are very kind-hearted and feed the deer. Um, note that this increases the spread of disease amongst the deer themselves and uh, feeding them high carb foods actually makes them can make them sick and even cause death and feeding them actually does the opposite of what we want to achieve um, it increases the deer population so those are reasons to not feed deer okay useful resources an excellent one is the native plant finder by the national wildlife federation um, in, you can you put in your zip code and it will give you um, suggested native plants and it will also tell you um, how valuable or what it's valuable for. For example, this is one on goldenrod. Um, so it will give you, as you can see here on the top right, it gives you species that are native in your area, different species of goldenrod native in your area. And then it also tells you um, which caterpillars it will host in your area. Now, this site is relatively new. So, um, you know, it's something that's being improved on and worked upon. Um, so like, as you can see with this one, you know, it didn't have a picture of goldenrod. And then again, there are different species. So, you know, there, that could be one reason for it, but it's a good place to start um, learning about what's good for you. Um, another excellent one is the Native Plant Society of New Jersey. All types of information on there. Um, excellent organization. You know, um, you know, there's so much is available on their website. So please uh, take a look at the Native Plant Society of New Jersey. You also have Mount Cuba Center in Delaware. The Native uh, Plant Trust, which is in, uh, covers more of New England and um, Homegrown National Park, which is the website that uh, for Doug Tallamy, where he tries to um, encourage gardeners to grow native plants. So these are all useful resources that where you can find all kinds of information on native plants. And we are now at the questions stage. <laughs> oh, Mike, I, that is just so much wonderful, wonderful information. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, we do have a uh, a couple questions here. There's, I think a few people, I bet a lot of people are wondering where you buy your plants or where okay. you recommend, places okay. that you recommend. 
we have a number of places in uh, New in well in New Jersey there are a number of um, mail order native plant nurseries such as Toad Shade is one. What was that again? Toad Shade Native okay. Plant Nursery okay. is one. Wild Ridge is another. Um, pollen Nation. That's very cute. Pollen Nation, yeah, yeah. Um, Toad Wild Ridge. Pollination. Um, there's one in, let's see, I forget if it's with Michigan or Wisconsin, um, which is a prairie moon. That's another one. Toad Shade and Wild Ridge are right in New Jersey. Um, prairie moon. And in Bergen County, um, Roslers up in Allendale, they they have a, a pretty good selection of native plants. I mean, they you know they sh they have a lot of things, of course, you know, um, native and non-native, but they do have a good variety of native plants as well. So Roslers and, and Allendale. And I'm also usually in the springtime, I notice a lot of um, nonprofit organizations will be running their own native plant sales to benefit like Morgan Farm. I'm in Montclair, so I think about a lot of them happening out here. But yeah, there seem to be April seems to be April, May. Yes, they do. Yeah, Native Plant Society also has one. So the New Jersey Native Plant Society, um, although they won't have one this spring. Um, actually, their, their spring one is kind of over. It was done uh, mail order. Um, but um, a number of other organizations, even the Audubon Society has one as well. So you can look into New Jersey Audubon and they will also have native plants for sale in the spring. And let's see, there's another uh, question about uh, ferns. Um, no, no, about the uh, evergreens, not evergreens. Um, whether those were for, the ones that you list, whether they were for shade or sun. Um, they are mostly for sun or part shade, part shade to sun. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, oh, I think another question just popped up because I certainly have a few of my own, but so, <laughs> oh, um, I, I'm not, I probably won't pronounce this right, but Hope is wondering if all um, euonymus plants, not native, E-U-O-N-S. Yes, euonymus. Um, there, I believe there, there is a native euonymus. Um, the majority of them are not. So, but there, there is at least one native euonymus, which would be fine to grow. I think that was that for the EU. Um, and well, I was wondering about climate change and how that would affect what we consider or what is native anymore, because as the climate crisis changes our temperature, I mean, like like peach trees, are they going to, I mean, is, is, that would be a really huge change um, down to like the entire plant, plant cycle. Yes, yeah. it's hard to, um, you know, that's one of those things that scientists are looking into and um, they do expect, well, well, basically what's going to happen is we'll be able to grow plants that um, we were not able to grow before that would be um, more, more from the south. Um, so plants from the south will be able to grow more of and even our um, for those of you familiar with our uh, climate zones, our, you know, at one time we were sown six, six, and now we've warmed up to, you know, more like zone seven, um, you know, so we're able to grow plants that grow in warmer areas. For some plants, that's a bad thing um, because plants that like it colder are uh, going to be, um, gone from areas that are, that are warming up. Um, there is a, the Native Plant Trust 
if you go to the Native Plant Trust website, I believe they had an article on that and they give the, um, that particular article gives specifics on some of the plants that will be lost in areas um, because of the cold weather, because they prefer cold weather. Um, oh, we have another question. If native rhododendrons are, think deer resistant. Rhododendrons? They're not. I thought I saw that on the <laughs> special edible list. Um, as you know, um, being on the board of Laurel Wood Arboretum, Laurel Wood is known for its collection of azaleas and rhododendrons. Um, and they are not necessarily, most of them are actually not native, uh, but no, they are uh, rhododendrons and azaleas are not deer resistant. Well, it seems like there's this tension between uh, being native and being deer resistant. Like it is, does seem like it's very hard to find. It is. It is because they've co-evolved. <laughs> you know that over, you know, over thousands of years or millions of years, you know, they co-evolved so that you know they can coexist, um, but. Um, the deer population, unfortunately, is just too large for our native plants at the moment. Okay, I have another, I have to take another two or three, let's see. Um, oh, the, uh, somebody's just wondering if we could send a list of the uh, plant purchase businesses to the people who registered. And um, I can go to, um, I'll, I'll just check over the recording and I can um, look at that. Or I can, I can email you a list as well if you wanna pass it on, that's fine. Thank you, thank you. I think I got them all down too. Um, but I, you know, I was also wondering about another last, oh, how, oh, Eleanor's wondering how you feel about deer population stabilization. Um, not sure what the question is. <laughs> um, I guess efforts to keep their population down. Well, yeah, I, you know, that I did mention that, you know, there, there has, we do need to find a way to keep their population at the sustainable level. Um, you know, it's all about diversity and, and what's sustainable. It's not about, you know, eliminating anything. You know, we, we work with food webs. Um, we, we need to have the correct balance in food webs. We need to have balanced ecosystems. Um, but the deer have no natural predators right now because their natural pred predators are um, wolves and um, what was it? Um, coyotes. Coyotes. We do have some coyotes, um, but you know, the, primarily the wolves and we don't have wolves in New Jersey. Um, if you go to New York state, like for example, New York state, you would think that upstate New York would also have a huge deer problem, but theirs is not as bad because they still do have wolves. Um, but we don't, so, you know, there, we need to find a way to keep that population at what is considered the sustainable level. And you're going to find this very odd, but in the early 1900s, uh, the deer had almost become extinct in our state. And it was conservation efforts that brought them back. And it was, it, it, so the early 1900s, they had almost gone extinct due to overhunting, one of the main causes. And the um, populations during the 1970s were brought back to what were considered the sustainable level. But unfortunately, since the 1970s, because they don't have predators, then the population keeps growing and multiplying. And uh, we are now at the opposite end where, you know, it's, uh, it's, they're overabundant. Well, uh, on that, uh, no, I was thinking there's um, uh, some children's books are just such great sources of just really um, the quickest information that <laughs> really great way to prep on things. But there is one beautiful children's book, uh, really beautifully illustrated um, about what happened after wolves were reintroduced to Yellowstone mm -hmm. National Park. And it is pretty much, it was a, just a, a change on every single level. I mean, it even rivers changed. Yeah, were totally. diverted into different patterns because of just how this adding this one predator just had this massive effect on the entire ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, that um, I'm familiar with um, 
uh, some of the work at Yellowstone. And yes, I found that amazing too, that it even that the deer population before the wolves had even caused the course, the course of rivers to change because the deer had eaten all the plants that grow along the edge. And so um, there was a lot of erosion um, and other issues. And uh, you know, they, they actually had changed the course of the rivers in which um, bringing back the wolves helped, but you know, I don't think we're going to be bringing back. They're not coming back here. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we have too too much a uh, too high a population for that. <laughs> well, though that does remind me that we, I do want to mention some of the great library services that we have too that can help you can help us all in our quest for a um, a sustainable, lovely garden. We have lots of. Uh, ebooks and also digital magazines too that you can get through Libby and you can borrow magazines, the hard copy of magazines too from the library if you'd like those and plenty of books. You can always call us at the reference desk if you're looking for any ideas. And we also have a lot of other programs coming up and, and even one about lawns, rethinking the lawn um, and uh, sustainable lawn care. And that is, um, I have to check the date for that one. Um, but the next, uh, our next program is going to be March 31st. And that's with a local um, suburban farmer. She uh, has a master's in agriculture. And uh, she's going to be talking about how you can stretch the growing season um, here in New Jersey. So I, oh, and then in the week after, actually next week we're um, having, or I think this might be in April, is, um, the uh it's real voices um so but it ties into what we're doing here and it's about the brooklyn community food co-op which a lot of people might have heard of or even belong to if they lived in brooklyn earlier it's a pretty one it's a pretty fascinating look at how this um uh, how this place this organization has changed and continued throughout i don't know 40 years or or so um so um Thank you all very much. And thank you so much, Lourdes. This is really fascinating. And yes. I can't wait to put some of this into action. Great. I thank you. Thank you, everybody. And have a great night. I hope, uh, you know, I hope that you, I was able to be of service to you and that there's a lot of information that you can use in your own garden. So have a great time, garden. Thank you. Good night, Lourdes. Good night.